What's up, YA? You guys alive? You guys alive and well? Well, if you guys don't know me, my name is Victoria. I am one of the ministry leaders here at YA, and we are so glad that you're with us. KG was so sweet to give an announcement. Just an FYI, you guys will see, we, we do have a new series coming up called As We Fight. We're going to be talking about spiritual warfare, which I don't know about you, I am like pumped for this next series. However, I'm not bringing the word about that tonight. I'm sorry. I have something a little bit more exciting for all of us. We're going to talk about money. Yay! <laughs> which is, a bit, it's basically spiritual warfare, right? Am I right? Anybody, a broke millennial in this room, come on. So, like I said, my name is Victoria. I'm so glad to be with you guys. Um, I hope you guys, I can't believe it's already August. Is anyone like, this is so weird to think about how summer is already done for some of us. I know a lot of us are in college uh, who are going back to school, sadly. Um, but I can't believe that August is here. And for me, it's a little bit even stranger because next month I am going to birth my first child. So that's a little weird. <laughs> You know, it's weird being pregnant. This is my first baby, obviously, and it's kind of strange being pregnant. You know, I'm not used to this summer bod. You know, it's a little bit unusual. Um, I do want to just share, this has nothing to do with my message, by the way. I wanted to share a quick story. I, if you follow me on Instagram, I, I sometimes like to share random pregnancy things. And I was at church uh, last week or the week before, and this lady comes up to me and was like, aren't you so happy now that your bump has like popped out? And I was like, that's such like a weird thing to tell somebody, right? And I was like, yeah, it's so cool. She's like, yeah, because it looked like you had a pooch for so long. That lady was like, okay, granted she was like 70 years old, so I'll give her the old lady pass. But still I'm like, that was my cookie pouch, okay? Like be nice to me. So yes, that's what you don't say to a pregnant lady, okay? So I'll be here after service. Think about the things you want to comment on, me being pregnant, and save them for later. So like I said, being pregnant is a little bit strange, but one of the craziest things is like you are at the threshold of adulting once you decide to bring a child into the world. And what I mean by that is uh, my husband, Scott, and I, we've been married for almost four years, and uh, we were <laughs> we have some Scott fans in the room apparently. <laughs> Uh, he, he's not here right now, but I'm going to tell him that you said that later. Uh, so, so my husband, Scott, and I, we've been married for four years, but we were, we were kind of getting ready for our child, right? And we had to think about how much money does it actually take to, like, raise a child in a year, right? Okay, so if you guys were to think about it, right, how, like, if you want to yell it out, how much do you think in one year it takes to raise a newborn baby in their first year of life? Well, how much do you think it is? $10,000. What else? A billion. <laughs> Kingdom cash, right? <laughs> How much? What else? Someone said something else. 30,000, 30, my word. <laughs> Close. It t it, okay, online, I, I looked up Dr. Google, and Dr. Google said that it costs about $12,000 for the first year of a child's life, right, to raise your child. $12,000 just for the first year year, right? And legally, you, you have to raise them for 18 years, legally, right? So, <laughs> I, can you imagine what my husband and I were like, we were going to pass out. We're like, no more Chipotle, no more like being able to go and get my nails done. We're basically living off of Top Ramen and like prayers, right? Money, money is scary. There's something so intimidating about money, right? And I'm not sure what season of life you're in, some of us are maybe towards the latter part of their 20s or 30s like me, and you might have a career, and you might have a lot of bills to pay. Some of you guys might be newly fresh in college, and you're like, my parents, I still live in my parents' house, I don't have rent, right? But we all deal with money, right? We all deal with finances. And you know what? I was looking online again, Dr. Google, and it said an average millennial, so this kind of this kind of incorporates some of you guys, but between the ages of 25 to 34, it says an average millennial person has over $42,000 in debt. That includes your school debt, obviously. That includes your car loans. That includes maybe your credit card bills, right? Over $42,000 in loans or debt. And I'm 
This is gonna be a safe place tonight, okay? Because we're family here. If you're new to young adults, you'll realize we're family here. And for me personally, that's like a small blip of the college school loans that my husband and I have together, right? We're far beyond 42,000. So debt is real for us as young adults, as millennials. And so we're gonna do an activity right now. And uh, this is gonna be a little intimidating. Like I said, we're family now, so we're going to all be real. So on your seat, you see a note card. It's blank. And uh, a pencil. I hope you didn't draw earlier or, like, play, like, mash or something during worship. I hope it's blank still. So <laughs> mash, right? Throwback. So what I'm going to ask you to do, you can do it secretly if you're embarrassed. Like, write it down. Write down the estimate of how much debt you currently have in your life right now, okay? So you can you can do it discreetly if you're like, I want no one to find out, right? So think about maybe some of you have credit cards. Some of you guys have a car that you're paying monthly payments for. Some of you guys are in college and you have college loans, all right? So guesstimate what that might be, okay? And we're going to collect that right now in the next one a minute and a half, okay? So Take the next minute really quickly, write down your guesstimate of the debt that you have accumulated, and I'm going to grab one and do one for myself. All right, so we got one minute on the clock, the figurative clock. I know, I know, math is hard. Some of us haven't taken a math class in years. Pull out your calculator on your phone if you need to. There's no shame. All right, when you're done, raise it up in the air like this. You don't have to show the number. Don't show, you don't have to show the number. Just raise it up when you're done. So, even if it's zero, okay? Even if it's zero, write down zero on your thing, okay? Write down zero. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to pass them down the rows. You could do it down so that no one can see it. You don't write your name on it. We don't want to know who you are. And we're going to be passing it, and I will be sharing a little bit about that at the end of the message. Are you guys curious to know how much debt we have in this room right now? I'm a little afraid. I already have a lot, a lot on this piece of paper right here. So we're going to be collecting those things right now. So pass them down to your aisles, and uh, we'll jump into the rest of the message has anyone like ever actually accumulated all their debt? For the, is this like their first time and you're like, I'm gonna throw up right now? I get it, I get it. So as they're collecting it, oh, look at it. It's a beautiful, beautiful slide. <laughs> right, so as you guys were writing those things down, right? So how many of us, how many of us would say, you don't have to say how much money you have, but how many of us would say like you have some sort of debt, whether it's school debt, car loan you pay for, maybe some of you guys opened a credit card when you were a teenager, right? There should be a lot of hands in this room because let's be real, we live in the world in a day and age where school is really expensive, college is expensive, right? Where it's so easy to open up a credit card. I remember the first time I got my first credit card, I was like, wow, this is, I could just like bring this to any store and like get whatever I want, right? It's so easy to open a credit card. You know, we have the monthly payments of cars that we need to pay back, right? It's so easy to consume everything, right? And we get this debt in our life. But could you imagine what would your life look like? And there are some of you in this room, kudos to you who get to do this, right? But what would your life look like if on that note card you got to write zero? What would your life look like if you had financial freedom, completely free of school loans, of car loans, right, completely free of financial debt. Because I really believe that our lives would look so differently, right? Our lives would look so differently if we had that type of freedom. But how many of us know that if we want to live in financial freedom, if you want to live in a place, right, where you get to write that zero in that note card, that we have to have discipline. <laughs> we have to have discipline. And who knows that discipline, whatever that looks like, is not an easy thing to have in our life. I don't know about you. Like I said, I'm going to have real talk tonight. I have a hard time being disciplined in my life. 
But who knows that discipline and freedom are not opposites, right? We think that if we want to be disciplined, all of a sudden it's structured and we have limitations. And all of a sudden, if we want to stick to a discipline, we don't have freedom. But how many of us know that discipline and freedom are not opposites, but they go hand in hand? And what I mean by that is that when we live disciplined, it actually leads to freedom. Our discipline to stay true to a conviction we have, right, leads us to freedom. Let me give an example. If you're disciplined with what you eat, which, by the way, I'm a little convicted right now, right? If you're disciplined by, with what you eat, right, no double-doubles, right? No, I know, I'm sorry, no Chick-fil-A, right? If we're disciplined with what we eat, right, we get to have the, the freedom of health, the freedom, right? If we have, uh, if, let me think of something else. If we have discipline with our Our sexuality, right? If we are disciplined with our sexuality, meaning disciplined by what we see, disciplined with what we look at on the computer, right? It leads us to sexual freedom, right? We're able to freely give ourselves away to that man, that woman that we get to marry one day, right? If we have that type of discipline. If we add discipline with our time and our resources, right, if we're able to say, I am going to be able to say yes to the things I want and be able to say no to things that don't fit who I am, right, if we're able to be disciplined with our time, we have the freedom to go and do what God has called us to do. And the same thing goes with our finances. When we're disciplined with our finances, when we decide, I'm going to commit a life of being disciplined with my money, It actually doesn't bind us, it sets us free. There's something so freeing that comes when we get to be not enslaved to our debt anymore, right? There's something so freeing that happens when we choose to be disciplined with our money, but who knows, right? If we're being real, that's really hard. It's really hard to be disciplined with our money. Clearly, if we go through all the note cards and read through the numbers, it's hard to be disciplined with our money. But Jesus, Jesus had a heart for our finances. He cared about our finances. I want to share something so interesting that I never thought about before. And I'm going to read this from here. Discipline with our money is more than just an, like an adulting concept, right? It's more than just learning to adult hard, right? Discipline with our money is a biblical truth, and Jesus talks about it all the time. So when Jesus walked on this earth, he would teach people by something we call parables. Does anyone know? Has anyone heard of, like, the parables before Jesus? What Jesus would do is he would tell a story. It would be a captivating story super random story, but he would use that as illustrations to teach. And when he was walking on this earth, he taught 30 parables. And the interesting thing that I never knew is that 16 out of his 30 parables, meaning more than 50%, was about money. (laughs) More than 50% of what Jesus taught on, right? He could have taught on anything while he was here on earth. But yet he chose to teach more than 50% of his time about finances, about money, how we live and deal and and steward our money. And the interesting part is that Jesus never asked for money. He never, when he was walking on earth, was panhandling, was like, can you Venmo me or like, you know, give me some PayPal, right? He never was asking for money, yet he always spoke about money. He was always after something, and he was always trying to to elude or teach us about it. He was never after money. But what he was after was our hearts, how our heart is postured towards money. Because the Bible teaches us over and over again that Jesus' heart for finances was not because he wanted to get money from us, right? But Jesus' heart for finances was birthed out of the truth that he knew that our finances was directly affected with our faith. That our finances was directly related to our heart, our heart posture. 
I'm reminded of a scripture that Jesus talks about in Matthew 6. And this is a popular one, but I wanted to read through it together as a, as a YA family because Jesus is speaking about money to his followers. And if you have your Bible or your phone, would you join me in opening up your Bibles to Matthew 6? Matthew 6. If you have your Bible or your phone with you, or if you have the internet on your phone, you can always look it up also. We're going to be in Matthew 6. And like I said, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his followers. And he's teaching about money. He's teaching about possessions. Like I said, Jesus was never after their money. He was never trying to, to be a beggar and say, hey, give me five bucks, right? But Jesus always spoke about the heart, the heart of the matter and the heart of money. And so this is what Jesus says. He's speaking to his followers, and we're going to start in verse 19. And this is what Jesus is saying. And if you don't have your Bible, you can read it up here with us. Jesus says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. He says, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, right, wherever that thing is that you desire, there the desires of your heart will also be. In verse 22, it says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. So when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. And this is the part that Jesus shares with his followers. He says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. What Jesus is saying is extremely clear here, right? He wasn't trying to ask them for money or ask for, him, for them to give him money. But he, what he was trying to communicate, right, is that we cannot be enslaved to, to both things. We cannot love God and be enslaved to money. They cannot go hand in hand. And the reality is that when we live in debt, when we live in a culture where we are constantly buying and purchasing and racking up bills, right, we cannot be enslaved to debt and serve God at the same time. Another way of saying it, what Jesus really is saying is that when it comes to money, we will either worship wealth or worship with our wealth. What Jesus is saying is that when it comes to money, we will either worship wealth, meaning we'll either worship and be enslaved by money and let money be the main drive of our life, or, or we can worship with our wealth, meaning giving that back to who really, who really it belongs to, right? Giving our wealth back as an act of worship. But like I said, we don't live in the times where Jesus was walking on earth. We live in 2019. And having financial discipline is difficult. Like I said, I know the average was $42,000 in debt, but I'm sure if I was going to go through those note cards, I would see there are a lot of people, myself included, whose debt is far larger than that, right? Why is it so hard to be disciplined with our money? And I was thinking of three things, three points, and maybe this is going to relate to you, but three reasons why I feel like we struggle with our money so much. And the first thing this might be you, this most certainly has been me throughout times in my life, is that the world that we live in is, is, is one that is so easily full of discontentment. <laughs> there are some of us that recognize in the culture we live in today, it's really easy to live in a place of discontentment. And what I mean by that is the idea that what you own, what you have, what you possess is never enough. Right? Let's be real. Let's be real. I know for me, 
When I see somebody holding an iPhone 5C, I'm like, that's so cute. What a, what a fossil. What an artifact, right? We look at the iPhones and they're like, you always want the latest iPhone. I got the iPhone 8 and the next thing you know, it was like the iPhone 10 R or whatever it's called, XR. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need it. I remember the other day I was telling my husband, I was like, I need the newest iPhone because I want the nicest camera, you know? And he was like, your phone is perfectly fine, Victoria. But for some reason, we always feel like we need the new next thing. That we feel so discontent with what we have that we're never satisfied until we have the new next thing. Right? I know for some of us, things like, you have a perfectly good working car. Your car works, you, you could put gas in it, you could drive wherever you need to, but for some reason, you feel embarrassed driving a 1996 Ford Explorer and you wanna get the latest 2019 Mazda, whatever, I don't know cars, but we have perfectly fine things, but for some reason, the world that we live in tells us it's never enough. Think about the day and age we live in when it comes to social media. Right, we can scroll through our feed, we can go on Instagram, we can look on Facebook or go on Twitter and see, wow, that person has, oh, I really wish I had that. Or wow, like I know for me as I'm getting older, I'm like, oh, I wish I could have a house like that one day or like, you know, like I said, that, that specific car, right? I don't need those things, but yet I'm so willing to swipe my credit card. I'm so willing to blow my money on these things, on the newest iPhone, not because I need it, but because I feel dissatisfied by what I have in my hands today. And there are some of us in this room who can relate, who maybe for you, your debt has come from a place of discontentment. You buy clothes you don't need. You own cars you don't need to have. Right, you own other things that maybe is just not important, but for some reason we feel the need to be impressive. We feel the need to, ha to have the latest thing, the newest thing, because it makes us feel good. But the Bible talks about that. The Bible talks about the, the, the temptation of discontentment in our finances. And if you guys wanna read with me on the screen, it's from Hebrews, and we're gonna read this passage together. And he, he's talking about, the author is talking about money and the discontentment. And it's from Hebrews 13, 5. And this is what the author says. It says, keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you have in your hands. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And what this scripture really is saying is that whatever we have in our hands can be enough if we choose to let it be enough for us. Because at the end of the day, we have something that will never leave us or forsake us. And at the end of the day, like we read in Matthew 6, those things, right, that latest iPhone, that newest car, those, those clothes that we own, those $200 shoes, I don't need to be rocking, right, those things are going to fade away someday. Jesus told us in that scripture we wrote, we don't get to take those things to heaven with us. Are you going to be willing to be content with what you have? So the first thing, the first thing of why I feel like our, our finances is hard to keep in track is because of our, the spirit of discontentment we live in. But the second thing is this idea of ownership. And what I mean by that is I'm going to ask you this question. Who truly owns your money? Who truly owns your money? who truly owns your money. Because this is where the tension is. And I, I, I don't know if you're feeling convicted, but as I was even writing this message, I was feeling convicted myself because our flesh, right, our, our humanness will want to say, I earned this money. I was the one who was working hard. I was the one working all those shifts and working those overtime. I should be able to do with what I want with my money, right? I earned it. I'm the one who did that. That's my money. I'm going to do what I want with it. Right? That's what my flesh wants to say. Right? That's the tension we live in. I get to own my money because I deserved it. I worked hard for it. It's mine. And yet, the reality is, is that everything you own in your life, from your money 
to your possessions was never yours to be earned, but that it's always been God blessing you out of his grace, out of his mercy, and at the end of the day, it all belongs to him. And so while our flesh wants to say, I earned this, I deserved this, I worked hard for it, the reality is that God owns everything, and he's the one who's given us everything that we have. So who owns your money? Who decides where your money is going to? Is it you? Is it you? Is it your flesh? Is it what you want? Because I want to challenge you. Here's the thing. I, that, that's my biggest struggle, if I'm being honest. If I was being real with you and I was sitting down at, to, with coffee with you, I would tell you that's my biggest struggle. I grew up in a family that was not wealthy. I grew up in a family that struggled with finances. My dad lost his job when I was in middle school. And I, I had a family, of, a large family, and it was really hard to keep finances in order. And so when I became an adult and I became a, a somebody who had a career and a job and a paycheck, I said, I'm going to protect this money because growing up I had none. And so I was so protective that I was like, this is mine. I did this. right? I worked hard for this. This is my money. I'm going to go bu- go shopping every time a paycheck comes in. I'm going to go out to eat with my friends, right? I'm going to I'm going to every time a new paycheck comes in, I'm like, I'm going crazy, right? I did that. Right? That's what my flesh wants to say. But Jesus is challenging us tonight, friends, from shifting our mindset to I earned this to the mindset of saying, God gave me this. God blessed me with this. And shifting the mindset of the ownership being mine to this idea of stewardship. And if you know anything about stewardship, Jesus talks a lot about it in his parables. This idea of believing that God is the one who gave me everything. So I'm going to be responsible by with what he's entrusted me with. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it again. Stewardship is this idea, this belief that God has given me everything that's in my hands. And so I'm going to be responsible with what he's entrusted me with. Are you being responsible with what God has entrusted you with? Are you being responsible with the money he has given you? Because let me tell you, friends, you didn't earn it. It's not because you're impressive. It's not because you have all this talent or you're an impressive employee. Yes, you've worked probably really hard, and kudos to you, and pat on the back, and I'm so proud of you, and I love you, but God is the one who's given us every blessing from above, and he's the one who owns it, and he's the one who deserves it, and it's our job to say, God, this was never mine. This was always yours. Right, well, how are we being good stewards of the money that God has entrusted us with. Who owns your money? And the last thing, right, the first thing that I shared is this idea of discontentment, and the second thing is about ownership. But the third reason why I feel like we struggle so much with our money is because we live in a world that says money is our security. Money is the thing that makes me valuable. Money is the thing that gives me value and worth. And what I mean by that, right, is that let's be be honest with each other. Our value can so easily be determined by what we own, what we possess, right, what our paycheck looks like. Even taking it one step further, we judge people by the cars they drive. We judge people, we ask them where they went to school. Oh, you went to Chafee, right? That's where I went. And I remember I would tell people I'd go to Chafee College or I went to Mount Sac. They're like, oh, I went to UC Berkeley. And I'm like, that's so cool, right? And for some reason, I would feel so crappy about myself because for whatever reason, our value, our security was placed in in, in, in possessions and things and our value, our security is found in what I earn and what kind of paycheck I have, where is our security? I'm going to ask you, where is your security? What do you find your security in? Is it a paycheck? Is it in your possessions? 
the things that you own, the things you get to post about on social media, online. Because if there's anything that we learned from the passage in Matthew, Jesus tells us, those treasures are gonna fade away, friends. Those things are not gonna last forever. In, in February, my husband and I lost my, my mother-in-law, which is my husband's mom, to cancer. And I remember sitting there at her memorial service and remembering this truth, right, that people didn't talk at her service. People didn't give speeches or shared with us during lunch about maybe the kind of house she owned. They didn't talk about what kind of car she drove, what kind of clothes that she weared. She talked about, they talked about how much they felt cared by her, how much they felt loved by her, her kindness, right, her, her gentleness. At the end of your life, friends, your possessions, your money, the things that we hold so tightly to are going to fade away. When it's your memorial, when it's your service, they're not gonna be talking about the type of paycheck you earned or what kind of car you drove or what college you graduated from. Jesus knew it all along. He talked about it so often because he knew that where our, our attention was, what, where our treasures lie, that's where the desires of our hearts would be also. So where is your treasure lying in? Because if I, if I were to guess, myself included, there are some of us who feel enslaved to our money, who feel enslaved to our debt. Maybe there are some of us who, who really feel like it's, it, it goes beyond just a number, right? Maybe for some of us, it's like, I can't stop spending money, right? There are some of us who feel like, I, I would love for that number that I wrote on the note card to be zero, but I can't find a way out. I don't know how I'm gonna get out of this debt. I don't know how I'm gonna do that. I'm just so curious, right? Because in a room this size, I know that our debt is probably greater than we think. And I know we have the number, if you could bring it up, what our total debt is in this room right now. And we have a group of about probably 100, 105 in this room right now. And the total debt, <laughs> oh, ooh. The total debt in this room, estimated, right, just this room of young adults, millennials alone, is currently $2,100,190. In this room of 100 people, over $2 million in debt, $2 million we have a room full of people who, who, who might feel like myself included, enslaved to the spirit of debt, two million dollars. And maybe we know, I know this is not what Jesus wants for me, for my life. And I've come to tell you the good news that Jesus can free us from debt, that Jesus can free us from being enslaved to money, that Jesus has the ability to do that for our lives. But we have to be willing, again, if we want the freedom, we have to be willing to choose the discipline also. We have to choose to be disciplined. We have to, be cho we have to choose to stay committed to finding freedom financially. It's not just a good pitch that I'm giving you. It's something that Jesus has been passionate about for your life, not because he wants your money, not because the church is trying to get your tithes right. He wants you to be financially free because can you imagine what your life would look like if you were able to be free from that $2 million of debt, right? There's something that happens, right? Jesus has always been about your freedom. Jesus has always been about you being free from the things that enslave us, and it's possible. So we're gonna pray together, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about it at the table. And I'm gonna share with you an awesome opportunity that's gonna be coming up next month. But let me pray for us. 
Jesus, we're so thankful that you are a God who, who, who designed us for freedom, that you hate seeing us enslaved to sin, whether that's finances or not. You have always been about setting the captives free, bringing freedom to the people who feel in bondage. And so, God, for some of us who just feel so convicted, who feel something needs to change, that, God, you would show them what change looks like, that you would show them, God, ways, practical ways in which they can be set free from financial debt, God. So we just, we just pray, God, that you would give us wisdom on what that looks like, that you would give us courage, that you would give us the spirit of discipline to be set free, God. We want to be used by you. And so, God, for some of us who live in a place of discontentment, for other of us who, who feel so um, enslaved by feeling like we own our money, for those of us who just feel like our security has been found in our money and in our possessions, God, that you would break those things and that, Jesus, we would be able to be freed from those things. So we give you tonight. And as we go to the tables, as we share that you would give us just a safe space to talk about what we are uh, what we are reflecting on tonight. Come and have your way. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. So before we go to the tables, and if this is your first time, every Thursday, for the most part, we get to come together at the tables behind you, and we talk a little bit more about the message. I do want to share one thing before we go. Before we start moving around, one thing that we have coming up next month that Water of Life is launching. If you guys join us on weekend services, you know that throughout the entire church, the entire campus, we are launching something that we are calling Momentum, also known as Financial Peace University. If you guys know, uh, uh, he goes by the name of Dave Ramsey. Uh, this is one of the most influential Christians in our day and age, and he is about seeing people set free from the bondage of money, the bondage of debt. And we are going to be implementing FPU here on Thursday nights in September. So what you're going to see is that in September, you're going to see us start a, a, a series on Financial Peace University, on living financially free. And I know... I know, obviously, because I saw it. There are some of us who probably need to be taking that next step on being financially free. And so we are going to be offering that next month here on a Thursday night. And uh, there are so many more details, but you'll find after service we're going to have a table that will be answering your questions about what that can look like. And we would love for you guys to join us next month in September, all throughout um, the next coming months on Thursday nights. We are going to be teaching it here on these nights with all of you guys what it means to live financially free. Jesus designed you for freedom. He doesn't want you to live there. And so together as a family, let's commit to living that disciplined life and seeing God set us free from our, fin our finances. Amen? All right, so if you guys want, we're going to head over to the tables right behind us. Um, find a table. It's not assigned. We'll have a table leader who would love to walk you through some questions and continue the conversation. We love you guys.